Welcome back to Liberty Bites on the Think Liberty Network. I'm your host, William Gadsden. You can follow me on Twitter at William underscore Gadsden and follow Think Liberty on Facebook, Twitter, or whatever your favorite social media outlet is. You can also follow me on Facebook at William Gadsden Political Commentator. Give us a follow and a like for updates on new episodes and more. We also have a Patreon now, so if you'd like to support our work, check it out at patreon.com slash think liberty patrons. All right, so today there are a couple of major current events going on that I want to talk about. Now, of course, the first one is the COVID-19, uh, also known as the coronavirus that is spreading around the world at this point. There are now more cases outside of China uh, than there were in China that we knew about at the time anyway, or that we continue to know about uh, based on what the Chinese government is telling us. But now we've got cases all across Europe, uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, and then now it's finally come to the U.S. So Washington State is in a state of emergency. San Francisco has declared, uh, declared a state of emergency, and there are now verified cases in New York, uh, New York State and New York City as well. So everybody's freaking out. We see the stock market take an absolute nosedive. There's videos of people fighting each other in grocery stores, and of course the mainstream media is really cranking up the paranoia and the fear factor. But what are some of the facts going on that a lot of people aren't talking about? Well, you've got between a 2 to 4% fatality rate for this disease, and most of those are from older people. Uh, you know, much like the flu, older people are more uh, prone to dying of it than younger people are, of course. And on top of that, you do have a 10% uh number of people that will be have to be hospitalized or put in a critical condition. So this isn't the apocalypse. This isn't the worst thing humanity has ever seen or ever dealt with. However, so in terms of people getting sick, it does have a high infection rate. And then from there, the variety of uh, symptoms, the, the in level of intensity of these symptoms varies pretty widely from there. But the symptoms of it aside and how many people could get sick aside, all of that, what a lot of people aren't talking about is the economic impact of the, is, uh, I guess it's officially a pandemic at this point. So if you have a high enough infection rate, that's immediately going to start impacting the supply chain. So on a macro level, we're already seeing that happen because a lot of our goods uh, are produced in China and then imported into the country, into a lot of Western countries from China. So because they're shutting down entire cities, we're already seeing the impact of that in the economy. But if you look at just the United States in particular, the more people get sick, the, those are more people that can't go to work and can't do their jobs. So now you've got semi-truck drivers and factory workers and shipping workers and all of these different people and all of these different sectors that are absolutely vital to our supply chain to provide us with the goods we need and of course the services we need especially when you're talking about large cities you're talking about cities with millions and millions of people living in them that only have a number of days worth of food and supply, supplies saved up, even in stores and things like that, because they're so dependent on shipping. So what happens when all of the workers in the shipping industry take a hit and those truck drivers and uh, train conductors and pilots for shipping uh, in aircraft and everything else? That's going to take a big hit. And that is what is going to impact people more than the disease itself. Now, on top of that, you also have to look at the heavy burden that this is going to take on hospitals and medical resources. So not only are you going to have people out of work in a lot of different areas and uh, functions, you're also going to have a much greater strain on the medical system and medical infrastructure and medical supply in the country. You'll have more people taking up hospital beds. You'll have more people needing certain kinds of medication and IVs and everything else. 
that is going to be a huge strain on that system as well. So we're talking about tons and tons of money, tons and tons of supplies, literal tons in this case, all being interrupted. And then, of course, we also have to consider the transnational, the international effect that this is having, but not just with supply chains. So, like I said, on the macro level, we already see an impact with Chinese factories and Chinese shipping and Chinese exports uh, and Chinese goods being imported into our own countries already being affected by this. But on top of that, I think we are already seeing how dangerous it is to depend on one country or one area of the world to produce and then send out all of the goods that we use on a daily basis. So we're already realizing, hey, maybe we should be producing more of this stuff at home. So I'm not suggesting that there is going to be some sort of huge global paradigm shift, but I think a lot of people are kind of sitting back and scratching their heads and going, it can take something as small as a virus spreading around that's you know, a little bit worse than the flu to shut down all of these things that our daily lives depend on. That's huge. So I think moving forward, a lot of people in very high levels of government and industry are going to start taking that a lot more seriously and looking at how we could curtail the damage that something like this uh, could bring onto our own economy. So the other major issue that I also wanted to talk about, this is truly historic. If you haven't seen it already, uh, Trump has agreed to sign a peace deal with the Taliban in Afghanistan, potentially ending the longest war that America has ever been involved in. So this is a conflict that has taken tens of thousands of lives, trillions of dollars, of course, it was the, the beachhead, if you will, for the global war on terrorism, which has ended up snowballing into at least six other countries around the world that we're involved in, and all of these things without a declaration of war from Congress. So this has the potential to end, and there are a lot of people on both sides of the political spectrum that are complaining about this. Which totally blows my mind. I mean, I get the the neocons, the war hawks, are saying, "Well, you know, you're you're this would make all of the lives that we've lost uh, for nothing, you know, or all of the money that we've spent for nothing. We need to continue on." But to what end? Not to mention using the lives lost and the money spent as motivation to continuing the war i mean that's just that's literally the definition of the sunken cost fallacy so you know you're not really winning <laughs> you're not winning yourself any favors here but you've also got a lot of neoliberals that are saying some of the same things all continuing to push for a war that we don't have any clear objectives in anymore there's no end in sight we don't know why we're there anymore so why not end it why not save lives that could be lost over there and save money that could be spent over there by going ahead and stopping it. But one particular thing about this at least potential uh, peace treaty or peace accord would be that the ultimate goal would have a full withdrawal, withdrawal excuse me, of U.S. troops out of the country by, I think it was 14 months from now, or excuse me, 14 months from it being signed. So that's an interesting number right there, right? 14 months. What's, what big event that Trump's involved in is coming up here pretty shortly? Well, the 2020 election, of course. So the idea is that if the Taliban follows the rules that are laid out in this agreement, then in 14 months, uh, all of the troops will come home. That's the idea. But I think this is, I'm not saying this is 4D chess or anything like that, you know, MAGA, MAGA, MAGA. I'm just saying this is a very shrewd move on Trump's part. It's smart. I don't think it's, it took some sort of genius to come up with. But hey, this is a pretty shrewd political move. What he is doing potentially is saying that I am the one putting this agreement on the table. I am the one that's going to end the war. But 
if I don't win 2020, then, you know, my opponent, the Democrat opponent, if they win, could take this option off the table. And you don't want that, do you? So vote for me. I think that's a pretty smart move. Um, Obviously, if that is the case, no one's going to be saying it out loud. But I do think that's an interesting aspect of what's going on here. And credit where credit is due. I've been very open with uh, my criticism of Trump on a lot of issues on this show. But man, if he pulls this off, that would absolutely be historic. And he does need to be praised for that. So we need to continue to praise him for the good things that he does and criticize him for the bad things he does. We need to be consistent in this. And this would absolutely be a good thing worthy of praise. So that's really all I wanted to go over today. I appreciate you listening, and I hope you'll come back next week to become more liberty-centered with us. I'm William Gaston with Think Liberty. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.